sometimes we get we get this uh, uh, email saying, can this can this project be approved by the ethics committee on telephone? And I think uh, that is something very dangerous, not only for your own self, but even for the organization, because uh, uh, you know, and uh, a submission has to be seen by a group of people from various uh, perspectives. So, other than other than specialties, uh, specialists from that particular area, uh, the proposal also has to be seen from a religious, local, a social, and a legal angle. And therefore, it's important for the entire committee to view the proposal and just not the scientific committee. The ethics committee is not a scientific committee that decides whether the science that is being done is appropriate or not. It is a committee that ensures that no harm is being caused to the patient during the research that takes place. Now, for that, the submission that comes to the ethics committee must have adequate information that we are not causing any harm to the patient. That has to be convincing. Because if it is not convincing, then tomorrow if anything happens, then there will be very serious implications, not only for the person who has done the research, but even for the organization. So I really want to dispel this myth that the ethics committee is a pain and a hindrance for my research. It is not. It is a committee that is meant to support uh, your work that you, that you want to carry out at this organization. And uh, the ethics committee then takes the responsibility to say that uh, ethically sound, not causing harm to the patient. Tomorrow, when the vaccination program starts, how many of you all would be willing to take the vaccine straight away? If the vaccine comes tomorrow, how many of you all would take the vaccine? No, no hands at all. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. And I'll tell you why it is, I mean, I do not know the reason why you're not putting your hand. But you want to do two things. You want to be satisfied that the vaccine is effective, right? Then only you'll want to take it. But more important than that, is the vaccine safe for my personal use? Isn't that important? Only when you're satisfied that it is not going to cause me any harm, forget the efficacy part, part of it. When I'm confident that it is not going to cause me any harm, then only I'll take the vaccine myself. You realize the importance of this? Safety always comes first. Efficacy is of secondary importance. And that is what the ethics committee is expected to do. The research project that you are undertaking, we are not worried about the, the efficacy of that. Of course, efficacy, if it is more effective, good. But we are more worried about, are you going to cause harm to the patient when you are going to undertake this research? Okay, have you understood the logic behind all this? Now it is with this logic that I thought I would just share with you a template that we would like you to submit your ethics committee proposals or your submissions in this format. Uh, the first page, you know, there should be a full first page that should be dedicated only for these areas. So what is the project title? <clears throat> the date it is submitted, the study code, Department wise. Now, this is something that I would recommend all of you all. Sanchiti Hospital has many departments. So we get we get proposals from physiotherapy, we get proposals from anesthesia, we get proposals from other departments. Now it'll be nice for each department to keep a register of all the submissions that are made to the ethics committee. A register that 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 you know, sequentially all the research projects are written one below the other. And then there is an identification number given to that. I think this will be useful because at the end of the day, at the end of that one year of academic period, you will get to know how many proposals were submitted to the ethics committee, how many proposals were fully completed, and how many proposals were finally published, or how many proposals actually created an impact in the, uh, in the, in the clinical practice. So it's important to have that kind of a register for each department. I would recommend you all to do that. Say, for example, the Department of Anesthesia sends a lot of proposals. 
So with the Department of NSSF, there's a simple register that says sequentially 2020 slash one, two, three, four, whatever it is. Proposal, just the title of the proposal, who is the principal investigator and submitted on what date. I don't think you need to take permission of the head of the department to do that because then there'll be too much of bureaucracy. So just to keep it simple, keep that register very open in the department, fill in those titles and get a number for that. That number is then submitted to the ethics committee. Okay. So that maybe that could come in the first three parts, the title, date, and the steady code. Then we need to have a clear name of the principal investigator, the qualifications, which department that person comes from, and the institute, obviously. We also need to have details of the email address and the phone number. This is in case we want to contact the person who has submitted the, the project to the ethics committee. In addition to that, we need to have the name of the co-investigator, the study coordinator, and the research assistant. It is important to name these people in the ethics committee submission. I'll tell you why. Supposing something untoward happens, and that person was responsible for wrongly giving some injection or whatever, that person's name is not there in the ethics committee submission itself. That's a problem. You know, so, so these things can be legally quite serious tomorrow. And therefore, it's important to make sure that anybody who's going to take part in this project, that person's name and at least email or phone number is specifically mentioned on the first page. Other than that, it's important to tick one of these. Is it an observational study? Is it a pre-post intervention study? Is it a case control study? Is it just a biological sample collection that you want to do? Is it a qualitative study? Is it a cross-sectional study? So the type of study that you want to, that this specific project is, maybe you just need to tick that in front of this. Then the next section is on background and, and introduction. This is a section that tells you why are you doing this project? <coughs> it is important. If you do not give an explanation as to why you're doing this project, then there'll be lots of questions that, you, that will be asked, okay? So these are the four areas <coughs> that you need to specifically focus your, uh, your background statements. And uh, you actually create a, a need for doing this study. After that, I think it's important to have a section on the research question. I would recommend all of you all to to realize the importance of asking a research question. You know, I've seen a lot of research proposals without a research question. Now, if you do not know what the research question is, you're not, you're not even sure what, 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 uh, what are you going to ask, what are you going to find? I have seen a lot of studies. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of studies where the title says something else and the conclusion is something else. Completely discordant, completely discordant. I think you have to be very, very clear that you are doing this study with a very specific focus and there is a question that needs to be answered. Many people do not write this section and it's important as a researcher, you know, anywhere in the world, no research project is submitted, no research proposal is submitted without having the research question in hand. You have to have a research question. Based on the research question, then you have your primary and secondary aims and objectives. Then you have your outcome definitions or the output that you're exp that you're going to collect through this. And then finally, that decides the study design. So research question should be the first part of your other, other than the background. There should be a research question, and at the end of that, there should be a question mark. Many people write the objectives of the study and that is the research question. No, an objective is a, is, a, is a consequence of the research question that you're asking. So it has to be a statement, a very specific statement with a question mark at the end. And you're going to find an answer for that in this project. Okay, so please remember to put a research question. And then based on that, you have these three components at least. What are your aims? 
uh, what are your outcomes and what is your study design. So study design will also have to be specifically mentioned. As I said in the earlier, in the first slide, is it a case report? Is it a systematic review? Is it a case control study? Is it a cross-sectional survey? Whatever it is, it's important to mention this. In whom will the study be conducted? So the target population is also a very important component of the submission that you do. And then obviously this has to be followed by the inclusion and the exclusion criteria. This is key. One of the biggest threats of good quality research, you know what it is? The biggest threat. And every journal who wants to publish that article will first and foremost look for presence of that. You know what it is? Bias. Is your study biased? You know, I have seen research proposals with a title to prove the efficacy of XYZ in the treatment of so and so. This is a biased question, isn't it? No scientific uh, committee will ever approve that kind of a project because you want to prove it in the first place. The moment you want to prove something that works, you are already biased towards that towards the, 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 the answer that you're looking for. And therefore you will do anything under the sun to show that it works. Are you feeling better? Are you feeling, are you feeling better? You know, when you ask that question to the patient, you want the patient to say yes. Are you feeling better now? You want the patient to say no. Are you feeling better now? Maybe you're not doing it on purpose. But you want that patient to say, no, I'm not feeling better with this placebo treatment. Because you want to prove that your treatment is better than the other treatment. So bias is the biggest threat that any research project has. And it is important for your proposal that you submit to show that there is minimal bias in that particular study. Okay. So it has to have all the inclusion and the exclusion criteria. Then it should include all the sampling methods, the recruitment process. How will you recruit patients for a study? Bias can be easily introduced into the step. So think of your target population and plan very carefully. Whenever you submit a proposal, please look for any potential areas of bias and minimize the bias as much as possible. Because the editors and the reviewers can easily see through everything they can easily see through the bias that you had uh, when you conducted the study. So uh, I will give you the copy of this presentation. It's already there with uh, the ethics committee. So please, uh, you don't have to uh, click this. You, you, you can have a copy of all this. But by and large, these are the components that you need to submit. Then the study procedures. How will you do the study? These details are very important because they determine the quality of your work. And again, the bias element is also an important component that you, to, that you need to minimize when you conduct the study procedure. So uh, just very quickly, uh, where will the data be collected? Will it be collected during the clinic? Will it be collected outside the clinic? How often will it be collected? Who will collect the data? How will the data be entered? Who will enter the data into uh, the if it's a if it's a computer in the Excel sheet, how do you how will you check the data and so on? I'll, I'll tell you through experience. Even the simple thing like copying from a piece of paper to the computer, there is a potential for an error. And I'll tell you, we paid such a heavy price for it. We spent lakhs and lakhs of rupees to do one study. And uh, during the data entry process, we had a single data entry operator. So only one person was entering the data from the data collection sheet. It was a huge study into the computer. We believe that the person who is entering the data is doing the correct thing. And then when we did the prevalence studies or the risk factors, we could not identify anything very interesting. And we were very surprised, you know, despite spending so much of money on this project, there was nothing, there's no output that was coming. Then, then we said, why don't we do us just, you know, ensure that the data that was transferred from the paper to the computer. Let's do a random sample and see if there is any error in that. 
And in that random sampling, we found an error of around 3%, 3% only. And then we then had to do the data entry again, this time double data entry. Two people entered the data independently. And then when we compared, is there concordance or is there discordance between the two? Now, when we did that, the results completely changed. Now, that person who was entering the data was not doing anything on purpose at all. It was just a human error. A human error that happens very frequently when you transfer information from one piece of paper to the computer. It is very common. So even that process of data transfer is also very important to minimize an error. So how are you going to overcome that, uh, that whole process of data management and data analysis? At the end of this, it's important to talk about the study limitations. And especially for anesthetics, it's important to talk about what are the potential harmful effects that may be created by this intervention. You know, you're always trying to improve the pain or reduce the pain or improve the efficacy of the anesthesia on very and on specific uh, surgeries. However, you can say that there is a potential for, uh, you know, uh, uh, some extra pain that may happen in this patient, but we are not doing it on purpose. We are doing it uh, with the full intention of only understanding whether this is better or not. State it. Please state that. So tomorrow, if anything happens, the patient goes to the court and says, Hamko batai bhi tha ki isse hamko jada pain ho sakta hai. Batai bhi tha. Then you're in a suit. But had you included that in your study protocol that went to the ethics committee and also captured it in your informed consent form, then nothing can happen to you. So this is important. This is important. If there are any untoward effects that you're expecting, it is important to mention that. Important to mention that at the same time, important to mention that to your patients as well. Then data analysis. Provide a statistical plan for each specific aim. It's important. You know, there is there is so much, there's so much of good research that taking place here. But the way the data is analyzed, uh, sometimes I feel very sad for that. Because, uh, you know, different ways of analysis can give you different results. And if you're using the wrong kind of analysis, you will not get the good quality results that you're expecting. So always plan for a good statistical analysis plan for that. Then at the end of this, how are you going to use the study results? Who is going to benefit? How are the how are that how are, how is the community going to benefit out of this? Is what must be stated very clearly. And then finally, it's important to have these appendices also. Uh, your data collection form, a copy of that, or if you're doing a survey, a copy of that. Uh, any recruitment material where you want to do advertisements, very important. You want to do put an advertisement in the hospital to say that anybody with osteoarthritis who would like to take part in a, in, a, in a clinical trial, please come and meet us. Now, that advertisement has to be approved by the ethics committee. You cannot put an, uh, you, you cannot put an advertisement anywhere without the approval of the ethics committee. Okay. Why is the ethics committee important over here? Why do you think the ethics committee is necessary to approve it? Because the ethics committee will ensure that you're not creating too much of undue. You're not paying too much to the patient. You're luring the patient to take part into the study. That is the only reason why the ethics committee approvals are necessary in these type of studies. Okay. So, uh, a material like this must also be submitted and that material must specifically be approved. Even when you display that uh, advertisement on the notice board, bill it should say that this advertisement is approved by the ethics committee of SIOR. I think uh, then, then you'll be in safe hands. Okay, so I'm going to stop over here because I thought this was just the uh, you know a rough idea about what actually should be submitted to the ethics committee. Please take the submissions to the ethics committee seriously. It is for your own benefit. It is for the benefit of the organization. Because if anything, I can tell you through experience, one bad untoward incidence, the whole hospital gets a black tag. You know, it's, the media is only waiting for this. One mistake by anybody, and then there'll be a 
news in the newspaper saying such and such a thing happened at this 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 institute so the ethics committee is responsible to ensure that we do not have any such uh, events uh, but for that we need you to provide us with the right information any questions that you would like to ask any questions any comments or yes sir We want to publish it at the RBS. So, do we wait? Have to wait for the next PC meet, or we can convey you this in because that will take a very long time to publish. This. Good question. Good question. Say, for example, you had a very exciting case, and you then then what you do is in the proposal you say you submit, you say that we have already collected information retrospectively. For which we would like to publish it uh, tomorrow. So you want a retrospective, and plus you want to do prospective. Oh, just the retrospective. You just want to do a retrospective study. Then just submit it to the research uh, to the ethics committee as we have been collecting, and we would like to compile all this information together and submit it for publication. Uh, the ethics committee will more, be more than happy to do that so as a retrospective study. But we don't have to wait for the next PC meeting for this. Meeting. No, no. Can you just put it on the so that that's what we can make it? So you can say, well, it depends on how keen you are to publish it. If you think this is absolutely crucial, somebody else will report it otherwise, you know, before me, then you can say that uh, under, under, under consideration by our ethics committee. You can say that, but, but keep this as a very, very exceptional thing. Uh, it's important to have an ethics committee approval before you submit it for. Uh, The second question was regarding the uh, consent, uh, which uh, sometimes we do a lot of cadaveric decisions, but this is in the other hospital. So, for example, we do it in Bharti Vidya Pit or maybe in uh, Mysore with some of the, my colleagues in anatomy. Research. So, we were asked to have consent. I did not understand what consent uh, was required in this case for a cadaveric uh, study. Uh, you know, it is. it will be useful to have a generic consent. To say that uh, you know the cadaver has come to the institute with a very specific goal. Uh, the goal is to educate the, the medical community. Uh, by by when the cadaver comes to the medical hospital, or it implies that all permissions are given to whoever, whoever wants to do research on that. Uh, it is just I think it will be useful for you to have a very generic statement. Uh, submitted to the ethics committee that we will be collecting these uh, this material from the cadavers for our own research purposes. Uh, obviously, there's, there's no question of any disclosure of any name of who that person was. So, no, th th there'll be no uh, compromise on uh, the identity of the person. Uh, so, we just want it for a pure research purpose. If you if you if you keep that and just get an approval, I think it's it will be useful. So, do they any other department in the other hospital have to submit to their AC and to your and then they have to combine this together? How is it? That's a good question. So, if you have uh, Bharati with the, if you have to go to Bharati with the peach, collect a sample from there, then it's important to take Bharati with the peach ethics committee because this institute cannot approve anything that is happening there. For our student postgraduate uh, dissertation, the investigator could be the student who is doing the research. Yes, sir. But uh, our guide, so there is no provision in your, uh, in your thing for a guide or anything. So, so, so I think you should feel that uh, this is a postgraduate uh, dissertation conducted by this student so and so under the supervision of so and so. Okay. I think it has to be very specifically spelled out. I think if you follow the format that I have given you today, this is exactly the same format that you uh, use for submitting your published papers. So once this is done, once the protocol is written well, clearly well, clearly written, then writing the publication becomes very simple. So it's important to do the hard work right in the beginning. Your ethics committee is happy and you're already ready with the submission for any journal tomorrow. Yes, yes. Uh, so thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, 
uh, when we were talking in terms of limitations when we are submitting uh, i was not a bit clear because generally we identify limitations at the end of the study that we talk about the confounders and everything so what sort of limitations can be identified previously and if you are identifying them can they be corrected in advance is it possible so uh, in the study design if you are doing a cross sectional study a case control study and the controls are not you are not getting adequate case controls you are not getting the appropriate case controls you are not getting age match gender match case controls that is going to be a limitation of your study uh, so limitations will essentially be study methodology based where uh, you say that there is a potential bias but uh, I, uh, I, i mean i have tried to minimize it as much as i possibly could but you never know tomorrow tomorrow i could still uh, my results could still be confounded by other factors which i am as of now i'm not aware of so those would be the limitations uh, maybe the sample size you you your anticipation was a very big sample size but you got only 70% of the sample size because there is, you, you tried very hard to get patients but you didn't get so those would be the limitations we are talking about sufficient because those are what will happen in the submission also will happen so limitations i'll tell you what i meant by limitations was uh, potential for harm those are the limitations i mean that's what i actually meant is patient is likely to be harmed during this research project or not uh, and if the patient is likely to be harmed it's important to inform the patient and i'm also informing the ethics committee that this is these are the possible harms that may come out of this intervention uh, but Uh, there's nothing not not under our control. I think once you spell it out, then you're safe. Okay. How important is the consent uh, in terms of CDO or this? What precautions should we take? Will you do a video consent? <laughs> no. In general, what, what should we follow in terms of consent? A written informed consent is the best way to safeguard yourself. you have to have evidence that it was an informed consent now that information was disseminated to the patient uh, or the study participant there has to be someone who has to vouch for it i think is important if the person is educated, educated it's fine so, so how does the informed consent part of it be reflected in the paper in the paper how should it be what is important to what, what, what should be the component of the uh, informed consent so the informed consent should comprise of why are we doing this study uh, you are a participant who will be uh, uh, you know uh, exposed to this this particular intervention we believe that this intervention is safer and more effective than the existing ones but there is a potential that it may not work at all and there is a small potential that it may actually cause harm but as of now the evidence that it may cause harm is very limited and therefore uh, it's, it's just important for us to inform you about that so uh, those components where efficacy cannot be guaranteed and safety we have taken every precaution to ensure that you will not be harmed but despite all that there is a potential that some harm may occur uh, which you will have to uh, take that as a uh, as a risk and you are willing to take that as a risk uh, so the patient will actually testify that yes i have been explained this there is a potential that i may have these 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 adverse events and i am willing to take part into the study uh, because i believe that it will advance science further so i think those are the informed consent that should be the composition of the informed consent a lot of uh, work comes from the anesthesia department it's important to inform the patient that there is a potential that there may be uh, it may work it may not work it may cause a little bit of harm so please spell it out in the informed consent and inform the ethics committee as well so there are there are there are two filters that have actually seen it and said okay there is a potential for harm but we still believe that this project is important to be undertaken for the betterment of science then there is some defense for you but if it is not informed to the patient in the first place then i think then it becomes difficult thank you thank you sir thank you very much <laughs>